Well, amen. I hope that is your testimony. And if it isn't, then we're praying for you, praying that that would be true of you as well, that Jesus coming and paying the penalty for our sin, lived the life that we should have lived, died the death that we deserved, so that we could be redeemed and back into fellowship and relationship with our Heavenly Father. Well, we are, after taking a week break, we are going to be back in Genesis. If you have your Bibles, open up to Genesis chapter 30. We got through half of this two weeks ago, and we're going to pick up right where we left off two weeks ago, where we read about the birth wars, right, where we see this back and forth between uh, four women that are wives of Jacob, and we see how we saw how God uses the most unusual agencies to accomplish his purposes. Even the dumpster fire that is Jacob's family that he had created, we see that even in the midst of that, God is in control. The Lord is able. There's not a, a one part of this life where God's fingertips do not reach and have influence over. God was in control back then. He was in control last week. He, he's in control this week, and he will continue to be in control in the months and the years ahead. And whatever unfolds, listen, Christians, we know that our God sits on his throne, amen? Our God is able, and there's no greater display of that than in the testimonies of his people where God has pulled people out of darkness and into light where God has brought people from death spiritually to life. People who were once dead in their sin who are now alive in Christ because our God is in full control. He is even in control of sheep breeding, as we're about to see. I know, weird segue. <laughs> really weird segue, but that's what we're going to read about. Genesis 30, starting in verse 25, it says, As soon as Rachel had born Joseph, Jacob said to Laban, send me away that I may go to my own home and, and to my country. Now this is immediately after Joseph is born. We see he is like, let me, let me go back to my, my own place of origin. Give me my wives and my children from whom I have served you that I may go for you know the service that I have given you. 14 years at least have passed since Jacob had to flee his home, he had to run away because his brother wanted to kill him. And he goes, he goes up to Haran with, with nothing, right? Like he has nothing but a staff. And he finds Uncle Laban. And Uncle Laban takes him in and he begins to work for Laban. A month passes and, and Laban offers to pay him. And because Jacob is in love with his daughter, Rachel, he says that, He'll serve and work for her hand in marriage for seven years. But remember, Laban, who is the trickster, he Jacob's Jacob, and instead of sending his daughter Rachel to the marriage tent, he sends his older daughter Leah. It's not what Jacob worked for. That wasn't the agreement. And so Jacob confronts him, and Laban says, you want Rachel? Fine, but you have to work another seven years. So, so again, it's been 14 years now that he has been working for Laban. And really, it's in those second seven years that the birth wars happen. Think about this. A lot changed in seven years for Jacob. In seven years' time, he went from being a single dude to being married to two women, and eventually, in the next seven, to four women. And he has 12 children, 11 sons and a daughter. In seven years, so much has changed. Now with the large family and his second seven-year contract over, Jacob wants to go home, right? He's like, listen, all right, I've worked off the second seven. The lot has changed. I want to take my family back home. I'm sure he yearned to be back in the promised land. I'm sure that, remember, he was a mama's boy. I'm sure that he wanted to go back and see his mom. I'm sure he wanted to introduce his children to their grandparents, but Laban doesn't want Jacob to go, not because he would miss his daughters, not because he would miss his grandchildren, 
No, he doesn't want him to go because he's prospered because of Jacob. He's prospered exponentially under Jacob's care and his influence. And if you remember all the way back to Genesis 29, when Jacob first arrived in the land, all the other shepherds, you remember this? They're all kind of like hanging out at the well. And they're like, uh, like Jacob's like, hey, why don't, why don't you like move the big stone so that you can water your sheep? And he's trying to get rid of them because he sees uh, Rachel coming. And they're just kind of lounging around. And they're like, no, we wait until until there's more people to help us move the rock. This is actually a good indication um, that people in that area maybe weren't, didn't necessarily have the greatest work ethic. But we see Jacob flex and he lifts, the, he's, here's one thing, right? Like Jacob has a lot of things wrong with him. But one of the things that we see in scripture is that he had a really, really, really strong work ethic. He was a hard worker. Despite all his flaws, And Laban, who had very little, he becomes very rich under the employment arrangement of having Jacob work for him. However, Laban's rags to riches story wasn't due just to the fact that Jacob worked hard. Look at verse 27. So, but Laban said to him, if I have found favor in your sight, I have learned by divination. Okay, listen, this is, this is like a pagan practice, right, of looking Uh, maybe like fortune-telling, like looking at horoscopes of of trying to figure out why something happened apart from the one true God. We know that Laban is not a worshiper of Yahweh. We know that Laban does not, and we're going to see in in the coming chapters how he has these little idols and and household gods that he worships. And so he, he learns by divination. This is an evil practice to figure out why something happened. It says that the Lord, he learned that the Lord has blessed me because of you. In essence, he's saying, yes, I know. Listen, Jacob, I know that I have earned a lot, that I have become rich, not just because you are a hard worker. I have learned that it is because of of your God. Your God has blessed you, and through you, he has also blessed me. He has blessed me because of you. Name your wages and I will give it. He does not want Jacob to leave because Jacob has made him prosper. Now think about this. The God that has made covenant promises, the God who would be with Jacob, even though Laban does not worship him, Laban looks around at all he has. He looks around and he sees how he has prospered. And just in how he has prospered because of the God that Jacob worshipped, he's like acknowledging the fact that God is real and alive. He recognizes that what has taken place is not normal. That what has taken place has taken place because God is with Jacob. That God is caring for him. And Laban, because he is close to Jacob, he's experienced the overflow of that blessing. He's benefiting because of God's commitment to Jacob. Hey, how many of us would say that that's true of us as well? May we be a blessing to those around us. May the people we work beside, the people we live beside, the people that we do life with, May they benefit because of our relationship with God as well. Continues, verse 29. He's like, hey, listen, I'll pay you anything you want. If you stay and you work for me, I'll pay you anything you want. Look what Jacob says. Jacob says to him, you yourself know how I have served you and how your livestock has fared with me, for you had little before I came and has increased abundantly. And the Lord has blessed you wherever I turned. But now, when shall I provide for my own household also? He's like, I've got a growing family. Listen, Laban, you know. I've got 12 kids. I've got four wives. I have all these people that I need to take. Like, I need to start thinking about providing apart from you. So it's no surprise, right, that Laban says, name your price with everything that Jacob just said. Jacob's work has proven lucrative for Laban. Should Jacob trust Laban, though? No. 
right? Like over and over again, Laban has proven untrustworthy. And so let's see what happens. Laban's insistent. He said, what shall I give you? Jacob said, you shall not give me anything. If you will do this for me, I will again pass through your flock and keep it. Let me pass through all your flock today, removing it from it every speckled and spotted sheep and every black lamb and the spotted and speckled among the goats, and they shall be my wages. So my honesty will answer for me later when you come to look into my wages with you. Every one that is not speckled or spotted among the goats and black among the lambs, if found with me, shall be counted stolen. Okay, so a couple of things you have to understand. Back then, in this ancient world, goats tended to be black and sheep tended to be white. Uh, there were always some that were speckled, some that had spots, some that were striped, and always those were deemed less valuable. The, the, the ones that had what they would call blemishes or spots or they were speckled, they were less valuable. So in a sense, what Jacob is asking for is, hey, let me take the less valuable ones. Not just the ones that are less valuable, but also the ones that are more rare. This is a, a really, really good deal for Laban. I mean, if you think back to the sacrificial system back in the Old Testament, it was the lamb without what? Spot or blemish that was considered the most valuable. Jacob says, look, I'll, I'll take the less valuable ones, and that, that will be a way that will, this will be an easy way to ensure that I'm taking what I should take, and you're keeping what you get to keep. Very easy. We can just look and we can see. If you see me with some just plain white sheep, or some black goats, listen, then you know that I've stolen from you. Very, very easy way for them to be able to identify which is whose. And that arrangement, had it taken place properly, would have let Jacob have a good start, but it also would have been extremely beneficial for Laban. Jacob's taking the second-class livestock and the ones that tend to be less valuable, and that means Laban gets the Premier League. It means that, you know, he gets the Ford F-350 Super Duties, and, and, you know, Jacob's left with the Chevy and Dodge, okay? <laughs> That's what's going on. I mean, this deal is very, very good for Laban, except Laban is a greedy, greedy man. And even after he agrees to these terms, he's going to attempt to manipulate this situation and exploit Jacob. Look at what happens. Laban said, good, let it be as you have said. It's like immediately, yeah, why? Because this is good for you. But then look, but that day, that very day, Laban removed the male goats that were striped and spotted and all the female goats that were speckled and spotted, every one that had white on it and every lamb that was black. And he put them in the charge of his sons. And he set a distance of three days journey between himself and Jacob. And Jacob pastured the rest of Laban's flocks. <laughs> I mean, it's the very same day that he's like, yes, let it be done. This is good. And he immediately separates them and sends what would be Jacob's with his own sons three days away. I mean, imagine this scene. It's like the handshake happens and immediately he turns around and he goes and does this. Why, why does he try to do this? Because he's trying to monopolize the situation. He's trying to, listen, the spotted and speckled can't breed with the ones who are, you know, all white or all black. If they're three days away, then they're not going to produce more speckled and spotted for Jacob. And what does this even mean, though? Think about this. Well, what kind of confidence does Laban have in his own sons that he's like, okay, they're probably not going to prosper with you like they would if they would have kept them with Jacob? Ouch. Laban is not a good man, right? And so he does this, and he's, he's trying to keep his stock, his flock, continuing to grow, and Laban's to stay small. And wouldn't you think that he would want for his daughters, for his grandkids, even if he doesn't like his son-in-law, for the sake of his daughters and his grandchildren, wouldn't you think that he would want them to prosper as well? But that's not who Laban is. You know, back in Genesis 12, 
God made promises to Abraham, Jacob's grandfather, and he said of his offspring that would come after him, one of the things that God promised was that those who bless you, I will what? I will bless. But those who curse you, I will what? Curse. We're going to see that. We're going to see that happening. It applies in this situation. Before, even though he wasn't a great man, Laban looked after Jacob. He, he experienced tremendous blessing, but now, as he becomes so dangerous and he seeks to exploit Jacob, we know he is playing with fire, and we expect him to get burnt. And what follows is this really strange account where Jacob, who has been stolen from, or at least been openly opposed, he, he just gets on with the job, right? Like, what can he do about it? He just goes on working. Now, I think, that's, I think that's a word for some of us. Even in the midst of opposition, that we would just put our, our heads down and we would just keep working forward in obedience to God. And we're gonna see a big part of this is just him being obedient to God. Look at verse 37. It says, And Jacob took fresh sticks of poplar and almond and plane trees, And he peeled white streaks in them, exposing the white of the sticks. He set the sticks that he had peeled in front of the flocks in the troughs, that is, the watering places, where the flocks came to drink. And since they bred when they came to drink, the flocks bred in front of the sticks. And so the flocks brought forth striped, speckled, and spotted. And Jacob separated the lambs and set the faces of the flocks toward the striped and all the black in the flock of Laban. He put his own droves apart and did not put them with Laban's flock. Whenever the stronger of the flock were breeding, Jacob would lay the sticks in the troughs before the eyes of the flock, that they might breed among the sticks. But for the feebler of the flock, he would not lay them there. And so the feebler would be Laban's, and the stronger would be Jacob's. Well, that's weird. Anybody else? Like, what in the world is going on here. You know, is Jacob tapping into some wives' tale or superstition or voodoo breeding techniques? That's kind of what it seems like. Oh, just, you know, put some strips of white, like in the bark in there, and you, you know, like, seems really, really odd. And remember, the spotted and speckled sheep, they were less valuable, so I'm sure that back then, the shepherds had, like, these wives' tales of things that you shouldn't do in order to ensure that you wouldn't get speckled speckled and spotted. So is it that Jacob is just taking those old wives' tales and he's like, okay, this is what you're supposed to not do. Make sure that there aren't these sticks, you know, in the watering trough and, and make sure there aren't any whites of stumps showing while they're mating. Like, maybe he's just like, okay, I'm gonna do the opposite because the wives' tales tell, tell us not to do these things, so I want speckled and spotted, so I'm gonna do them. Is that what's going on here? You know, it kind of feels a little bit like, you know, Jacob is pouring some salt out and then throwing it over his shoulder, right? That kind of thing. That's what it feels like. <laughs> you guys ever, ever hear of any, like, crazy, superstitious things? Immediately, whenever I hear of superstition, I think of Michael Scott, where he's like, I- I- I'm not superstitious. I'm just a little stitious. Well, I had a guy... I had a guy that I played football with who his thing, his thing for good luck was he would not wash his girdle. Uh, Like, hey, we were on a win streak and so I'm not gonna wash that thing until we lose. We won a lot of games in a row. And and I'm telling you, like he would hang (laughs) that girdle up on the rack and when he would go to put it on, it was as stiff as a rock but he did not relent. Nine games, nine games. It was like over 10 weeks of not washing the girdle. Just can't imagine. That thing stank so bad. Is this just some strange, weird, superstitious thing? Well, it seems really desperate, doesn't it? It seems like this desperate move. And I would say that's the point. Jacob is desperate. He's the underdog. He's the oppressed. 
and he's desperately doing everything he possibly can, but not because, listen, not because it's an old wives' tale, not because it's some kind of powwowing that he's doing. Actually, we get insight into what he's doing in the very next chapter. If you look at verse, or chapter 31, verse 11 and 12, listen to what he's telling his wives about what's going on here, and he says, Then the angel of God said to me in a dream, Jacob, and I said, here I am. And he said, lift up your eyes and see all the goats that mate with the flock are striped, spotted, and mottled, for I have seen all that Laban is doing to you. What we see is that Jacob is actually operating under a divine instruction. God is actually telling him and shows him that all these sheep that are on the outside are actually just, you know, without spot or blemish, are actually striped. They're actually spotted. I don't know if this is God, like, you know, like miraculously showing Jacob that in the DNA of these sheep, They are carrying these recessive genes. I don't know. Maybe it is the fact that God, who is in control of everything and can do anything, maybe he is the one that even changed the DNA of those sheep for them to be able to even have spotted and speckled. Either way, Jacob is operating out of divine instruction. He's being obedient. And whether or not, you know, it's actually the fact that these Uh, which I would say probably is not the case, that these striped sticks that he peeled are actually causing the sheep to become spotted or not, or whether he's honestly just like, this will get them talking. I I can't wait to see them trying this very same thing when it's really not this that's doing it, it's God who's doing it. I don't know. We don't know. But here's the point. The point is he is working under divine instruction. The overarching answer to the question about this passage is that there was a providential means by which God allowed Jacob to prosper even though Laban was trying to cheat and defraud him. That should comfort you, children of God. God was counteracting Laban's cheating of Jacob. Apparently God had come to Jacob in a dream and told him what to do and then God directed the birth of the sheep and the goats to produce whatever Laban had forced Jacob to take out of the flocks. We are not told, again, if in Scripture, if God miraculously changed the genetic makeup of the flocks or whether he just divinely guided those with the genetic information for stripes, spots, and modeling to outcompete with the other animals. But either way, the point is that it was providentially directed. And look at the outcome. Verse 43, it says, Thus, the man increased greatly and had large flocks, female servants, and male servants, and camels, and donkeys. So even against all odds, he still, he still becomes prosperous. Why? Because God was with him. Because God had promised that he would make it so. Laban, who only ever thought of himself, he had already sold his daughters by deception. He he had very purposefully stolen from his son-in-law. He hated seeing Jacob prosper. He hated seeing somebody else doing well because it wasn't him. And according to the next chapter, Jacob did serve him with all his strength. Jacob didn't stop working hard, even in the midst of the horrible treatment. And we'll see in chapter 31 that Laban had actually changed Jacob's wages 10 times. It becomes more and more clear that Laban was an abuser and he was an advantage taker. And yet the more he abused Jacob, the more prosperous Jacob became. The more he seemed to lose, Laban seemed to lose in the process. You know, Laban is like so many, right? Like when somebody is confronted in their sin, you know, what we hope for and sometimes what we see is that when somebody is confronted about the sin in their lives and the damage that they have done around them, that their hearts soften. You know, oftentimes, 
the opposite happens as well. And that's what we see with Laban. Even though he's confronted, even though he's made aware of the damage that he's done, his heart isn't softened, it's hardened. We're going to see Laban, he's going to double down in his devious techniques. Yet all the time, even when Laban is at his worst, Jacob prospers. His herds grow. He, he, his herds grow despite the aggressive opposition that Jacob is experiencing. And so how do we explain that? Well, in this case, on one level, I, I could give, you know, like this speech on breeding techniques and genotypes and, you know, phenotypes, all of that. And I'm sure that would be really stimulating for you. That might explain a lot about how sheep multiply, but it wouldn't explain Genesis 30. This isn't a story about science or genetic engineering. This is a story about the providence of God. That's the only way to understand it's the providence of God. What affected the breeding of the sheep? God did. This is a story of God's unfolding providence. He is the mover and the shaker of Genesis chapter 30. <coughs> Excuse me. Psalm 50 verse 10 says, For every beast of the forest is mine. The cattle on a thousand hills is mine. Genesis chapter 30 just adds the sheep and the goats also. They are all his. He is the one in control. And this is a story of how in every obstacle, every circumstance, every, even animal, our God is in control. His providential control stretches over it all. John Piper has defined God's providence as God's purposeful sovereignty. I love that. God's providence is his purposeful sovereignty. In other words, when we talk about providence, we're not simply saying that God is in control. He is in control, right? He's the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is in full control. But the point of providence is that he has purpose in that control. He has purpose. It's more of a statement that the one who is in full control, control knows what he is doing. He has a plan and design in it. He is unfolding all the circumstances with his wisdom coming to bear. Listen, he, ha he has all power and he has all wisdom. Not only that, but he's loving. You combine those things and you get the providence of God. He's making it come together into a beautiful picture. And because he is the one who is in control, who is our God, who is good, who is loving, who is wonderful, listen, then the child of God can rest in the providence of God. Through all of the bumps, the ups and downs in our lives, we can rest and we can trust. It doesn't stop difficulty coming our way. L listen, listen, if you, if you remember one thing about this morning, listen, listen. Heartache is a part of the Christian pilgrimage. It is. Trials are part of our journey. We will be tested by fire, but in all of the circumstances that come, we don't need to let our mind spin helplessly out of control, for we know, we know that we know that we know that there will be a consummation of these things. There will be a time when the trials and the pain and the heartache will end. But until then, we can be sure that they are being weaved together towards something, and that something, because of the nature of our God, will be good. So I want to end, listen, with three points about providence. Three points. Number one, providence can't be stopped by human obstacles. The providence of God cannot be stopped by human obstacles. And when we come across this glorious doctrine of providence, the greatest hindrance to us really believing it or even embracing it is usually the pain that we've experienced in this life. 
It's because of the hard circumstances that we walk through. But I want you to notice in this story, in the Bible, listen, it makes it clear, pain is part of the Christian life. Difficulties come. Oppositions will come. Hardship and persecution from the world does not does come our direction, but that doesn't mean that God is not in control. Right? Like, isn't it those very things that make us be like, oh, start to question, like, why would God allow these things to happen? How, how can he be in control if this is happening to my world right now? But think about it in this chapter. We see selfish hearts. We read of exploitive employment arrangements. We read of family abuse. And you'll hear more about how Laban treats his daughters next week. All that's happening here is a cocktail of nastiness and brokenness that has all flown out of sinful hearts. You can't, listen, you can't read or preach out of Genesis 30 and preach to have your best life now. Right? You, just, you just can't. Preachers who would be inclined to go that direction will never open their Bibles to Genesis chapter 30. You can't because you read this story and what is highlighted to us is that those who are a part of God's family, listen, they cry, they hurt, they have opposition. And yet, though sin makes life so painful and hard for Jacob and his family in these moments, you see the providential control of God. It's not hindered in any way. Over the top of sinful hearts, over the top of theft, over the top of exploitation and family abuse is God's sovereignty, his purposeful sovereignty. It's his providence. And we live in a broken world. We, we cannot expect it to be perfect. Oh, but perfect is coming, amen? It's coming. But here and now it's broken, even though God is in control. And this section reminds us that brokenness and pain, although they are real, it doesn't negate the fact that our God is in control, that his providence continues to march forward. I mean, I have to go to Romans 8, 28, right? All things work together for the good of those who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose. All things. Now think about this, right? It doesn't say three things. It doesn't even say a hundred things. It says all things. Dwell on that for a minute. All things work together for the good of those who love God. That means, yes, the good things, but also the not so good things, the heartache. Yes. They work together for the good of those who love God. The mistreatment, yes. Me being overlooked at work, yes. The disappointments and the tragedies I've endured, yes. The sin that my family has done to me, yes. All things, every single one, the Lord is working over the long haul to bring it all together in a glorious story of redemption. Even the brokenness and even the hurt. Listen, none of it, none of it is an obstacle for the providence of God. And I know that many of you have experienced difficult things. I know many of you come from difficult backgrounds and maybe even now continue to live in situations when you feel like the biggest obstacle for you marching forward as a Christian, maybe it's even somebody who's living in the same house as you. Or maybe it's a situation you feel stuck in. Listen, it doesn't stop God. Uh, that's one of the glorious points highlighted in this text. Providence is not stopped by human obstacles. And then point number two is this. Providence grows the child of God. It, what, human obstacles can't. Things can't. Why? Because, listen, providence grows the child of God. It's a tool used by him to grow us and grow our appreciation of him. And that, right, we just acknowledge pain and suffering and heartache, they're real. We will suffer, we will cry. But what I'm not saying this morning is if you just read your systematic theology, right, and you get this down, you're like, oh, I understand, prov I understand providence. 
I get it. There's purpose in everything that God does. Okay, there's uh, that all of a sudden those things will go away. That's not what I'm saying. Actually, what I'm saying is it helps us understand why we're going through those things. It's the very things that help us experience what we know in our head, that God is always with us and he is for us and he's gonna work all things out for the good of those who love him. These are the things, listen, these are the things that help us not just have a head knowledge about this fact, but help us experience that we have an experiential knowledge of this fact as well. Pain doesn't disappear, but what comes through is you appreciating this wonderful truth that God is in control and he's working all things together. In the midst of the storm, we can trust. In the midst of the storm, we know that somebody is holding our hand. It's been through the hardest things in my life that God's care and presence have been the most tangible it's through some of the most difficult and painful times in my life where I can go, oh, when I read that God is with us and for us, man, I don't just know that in my head. I've experienced it. God's providence, his purposeful control is to build us up. It's to grow us. It's when we go through painful, dark experiences and we come to the point where he holds us that we really understand that aspect of our good God and that he is trustworthy. And that's something we see happen here to Jacob in the next chapter, verse five. He says, I see that your father does not regard me with favor as he did before talking to his wives, but the God of my father has been with me. It's through these painful years with Laban that he's going, oh, do you see how we're going to see him continue to change? Why? Because he's experienced such hardship. Verse 7, he says, yet your father has cheated me and changed my wages 10 times, but God did not permit him to harm me. You can hear the experience that Jacob has had with this. Verse 9, he says, thus God has taken away the livestock of your father and has given them to me. All of this to grow Jacob. Jacob looks back and he sees the providential hand of God in the midst of everything. Can you do that? When you look back over your life, do you see all the ways in which God has carried you? How he has directed and prepared you and molded you and shaped you? And in the moment, we don't fully understand what God is doing, right? Like, in the midst of that, we, we don't know. But when we turn and we look back and we reflect, that's when we oftentimes see God's hand through all of it. Someone has said, <laughs> providence is a lot like Hebrew. It can only be properly re be read backwards. Like if you don't know this about Hebrew, you actually read from right to left. And, and this is a lot like providence, right? You can only read it correctly backwards. You know, as you look back in, on Jacob in chapter 28, where he's fleeing from his brother, he was a, a man with knees knocking, right? Like he, he was afraid, he was nervous, he was fleeing for his life. And then in chapter 31, as he begins to head back to his homeland, he looks back on his life and he realizes God knew what he was doing. God was able. Isn't that our stories? Right? Isn't that exactly what we can say about God in our own lives? We don't just know about it, we experience it. And in turn, that strengthens us. Providence cannot be stopped by human obstacles. And providence grows the child of God. It grows our trust and our confidence in him. And then here's the last point. Point number three, providence is wonderful because God is wonderful. I know that's not super creative, <laughs> but, but hear me out on this. Providence is wonderful because God is wonderful. It's an amazing reality. Listen, uh, because if God was a tyrant and he was in control, that would not be wonderful. But God 
is full of love. He is good. He is faithful. And so he's a source of comfort. And again, if you look at uh, chapter 31, verse 13, it says this is where, like, it, uh, Jacob is telling the story about how God met with him and was giving him instructions on what to do. God said, I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed a pillar and made a vow to me. Uh, he's like, this is comforting. Like, listen, you know me. Jacob, you know me. I am the God of Bethel. And that takes us back, right, to 2815, where he lays his head on the rock for a pillow, and God comes to him in a dream, and he promises him some things. And one of the things that he promised him is that he would never leave him. I will be with you. I'm taking, I'm, you are going, but I will be with you. And now Genesis 31, 12, Jacob has lived long enough to see that God keeps his promises and God reminds Jacob in doing so that he is a God who is faithful to do all that he says. God's like, I am the God of Bethel. And Jacob, look at all that is around you. I've done it. I've kept it. I've fulfilled the words that I gave you. And listen, I know I've been saying a lot of the same things over and over and over again. And maybe you're thinking like, Eddie, we get it. We get it. But listen, do you get it? Because if you get it, it changes the way you live. It changes the way you think in the midst of any situation, in the midst of any circumstance. God is in control and he's good. He's a God of love. He's a God of light. He's a God who never makes mistakes. He's a God who does nothing wrong. He never does anything wrong. He's a God who cares for his children. He's a, a God who is present with his children. He's a God who has given specific promises to you and I. He's a God who is committed to us. He's a God who doesn't change because he's perfect. And I don't know how much you know about, you know, the ancient gods, but back in the day, right, like, they, it even happens now today. You know, hearing Emily talk about um, the people who she's going to get to go and minister to in Thailand. Like, they're doing whatever they can to try to manipulate the God of their choosing to do what they want them to do for them. It doesn't work like that with our God. He's not some despot. He's not cruel. He's not simply moving pieces in a chess game just at a whim. Rather, Jacob knew he's my God at Bethel. He's the God who talked to me when I was at my lowest and when I had nothing to offer. And he promised specific things to help me and he has kept all of those promises. And when I was terrified, he spoke and he changed the circumstances. And listen, if you are a Christian this morning, he is your God who has saved you, who sent his son into this world to live the life you could not, who punished his son instead of you, God so loved the world, right? He's the one who cares for us. That's why we call him our loving heavenly father. And providence, providence is a glorious doctrine. When you know the person who is in control and you are trusting the nature and the character of God. It's beautiful. And so my hope is that you leave here this morning, maybe with just maybe a, a, a breath of fresh air, that you would just take a deep breath and you would leave here no matter what you're facing when you walk out these doors, that you would understand that God has purpose for what he has you walking through right now. He has purpose and that purpose is for your good and it's for your strengthening. And that time is coming where you will see him fulfill that truth. Let me end with this. My youngest, Leo, is eight years old. Imagine some stranger stops at parent pickup and says to him, hey, hey, I've got some, I'm, I'm gonna take you to the store to get some candy. And that stranger would lure him into that stranger's vehicle and drive off. That's, that's a terrible thought, right? I, I, can't even, I can't even think about that happening. Why? Why is that terrible? 
Because that's a stranger, we don't know what their intentions are. We have no idea what will actually happen. But it's completely different if I show up at parent pickup and Leo jumps in my truck and I lean over and I tell him, Leo, we're, he would love this. Leo, we're gonna go to the store and I'm gonna get you some Sour Patch Kids. Maybe the dentist that wouldn't be good for his teeth, but we hear that and we immediately go, I mean, that's a good thing. Why? Because, because I'm his father. Because I love him. And I care for him. And I want the very best for him. It's the same with our loving heavenly father. It's how we need to understand providence. And providence can be, in a theoretical sense, it can be daunting Right, there is someone in control, and it's not me, and that freaks me out. But when we understand the heart of who God is, knowing that he is in control, man, man, is that a good thing. Man, can I rest in whatever gets thrown my direction, because God is loving, and he is in control. And listen, if you aren't a child of God, this is available to you. God himself has issued an invitation in scripture. This God who is king of kings, who is Lord of lords, who is in control of everything, should you repent of your sins? Should you turn away? Should you acknowledge the fact that you are in a sinner in need of a savior and you turn to him and you put your faith, hope, and trust in him, then listen, this, it can be true of you that he would put his arms around you and bring you into the family. And you can move forward knowing that even in this world full of brokenness and sin and suffering, a world that is always in flux, you can know the one who is actually in control of it all and you can know that he loves you. Amen? Let's pray. Father, what a a beautiful, glorious reality this is. That you are providentially leading all of us. That you are in control of it all. And you are good. And that no matter what, Father, we can trust you that you have purpose for every good thing, for every hard thing in our lives. Father, may we be a people who live in that reality, who no longer are full of anxiety, who are no longer shaking at our knees, who are fearful, but that we would be a people who are confident, not in ourselves, but in you, our God, who has things all under his control. Father, you are good. May we praise you in all situations. May we lift our voices in praise to you no matter what we face as we walk out these doors. May you be glorified. May you be made much of in good and the bad. Thank you for your promises and for not giving up on us and being committed to what you have promised and what you have said. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you go ahead and stand and sing in response to this truth?